Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for all for being here. My name is Ketan, and I'm excited to be here talking to you all today. Um, I've given a few talks here at Product School over the years, uh, but I'm particularly excited and perhaps a little bit nervous uh, as I'm talking about a topic that uh, is really close to my heart and uh, really hits me home, um, which is about my own mistakes. Um, you know, the, the kinds of mistakes that I have done over the past eight years in my career as a product manager um, and the lessons that I have learned from, um, from making those mistakes. And today what I want to do and hope to do is share some of those lessons learned um, and the scenarios in which I ended up making those mistakes um, as uh, it may help not just myself, but uh, to a wider group of people so that you can uh, prevent yourself from making the same mistakes that, uh, uh, that I did. And uh, so uh, before we begin there, I uh, want to you know, share a little bit about uh, myself and uh, introduce myself. I'm currently a product manager and a product lead uh, at a cybersecurity and a cyber insurance startup called Us Coalition. Uh, we're really disrupting the security and the insurance space together for uh, small and medium-sized businesses. And I lead a lot of the uh, insurance product efforts there. Um, I've been there for about uh, two years now, though until recently, um, I spent several years on the product team at Dropbox. Um, I built out uh, the uh, several core components of the Dropbox platform and ecosystem team um, for third-party integrations and APIs. Um, I spent time on the growth and analytics team. I spent some time on the data infrastructure team. Uh, so just uh, spent a lot of time doing different tours of duty there. Um, and prior to Dropbox, um, you know, I spent uh, you know, working at enterprise SaaS startups, um, as well as uh, try to build, uh, uh, you know, my own venture out of MIT. Uh, but, um, you know, long story short, I've been a PM for uh, close to nine years now uh, and worked in a variety of um, uh, companies of different sizes. And, uh, you know, each of those experiences has, uh, has, has given its own share of lessons, um, uh, lessons to me. And, um, you know, we, we wanna talk about mistakes uh, and failures and learning from them. Uh, obviously we've all heard about this cliched saying of failure being the stepping stone for success. And there's obviously there's a, a, an expectation of repeated failures leading to success. But I'm curious if any one of you has wondered why this happens. Um, is there a biological reason for this? Is there a physiological reason for this? where repeated failures lead to success or you just fail enough times and you get lucky once and then you become successful. Well, there is a book that I would recommend um, for all of you to read, uh, which is called The Talent Code by Daniel Coyle. Um, the book is really a fantastic read, but I'll summarize a few key takeaways that I had with respect to you know, how talent and success get built. The book says that the key to learning and skill building is that little bit of white matter in our brains called as myelin. And this white matter actually leads to learning and skill building in a variety of areas, whether that is tennis players, musicians, soccer players, in any of those creative fields um, or the arts, this is the uh, physiological or biological reason why we become better with time, why failure uh, enables us to become better with time. And there are proven ways to increase the amount of myelin or grow myelin within our brain. Um, for instance, the book says, uh, gives good examples of musicians making progress as they're learning complicated sequence to play. So the way uh, musicians look like when they are truly learning is, and making progress is they make a sequence of small failures during their practice. And they have this intense expression of you know, being concentrated. And so what they do is they try a move. They fail at making the move, maybe a complicated sequence of, of, of uh, keys to be played if you're a pianist. Then they stop and think. They do it more slowly. They fail again, stop to think again, do it more slowly. So they go through this like cycle of breaking the move or the sequence down into its component bits, really trying to figure out how to play it they also slow the speed down and, um, and, and, and over time they become better and better. And what's ha what happens during this phase 
is that the myelin in their brain actually grows. So they are creating the sort of pattern recognition and the sort of building blocks necessary for them to become better over time. So, so what the book summarizes is that, you know, effortlessness, which means like the ease of doing something is great for performance. So if I'm a pianist doing uh, a complicated uh, concert, it's great if I'm performing well, but when I'm practicing, I need to fail often. Um, and the more we generate brain impulses through overcoming difficulties, the more scaffolding we build and the faster way we learn. Uh, and so that's how the mistakes turn into skills. The, the difference between a musician and a product manager is that a musician can practice at home. Um, whereas a product manager, perhaps, uh, you know, the, the real testing ground for us is building products with our teams, with our engineers, with our salespeople, launching them into the market um, and, and getting the signal on how well it does. So uh, even though, you know, for us, the, the, the lessons from, from the talent code may not be applicable one-to-one, -one, the fundamental rules still apply, which is that, you know, as you make mistakes, you build this uh, library of patterns, you build this library of past mistakes and you get better over time. So what that really means is that, you know, you need to learn from the mistakes of others. Um, you know, you can't wait to make all of them yourself. Uh, there's obviously this famous saying which says that you must learn from the mistake of others. You will never live long enough to make them yourself. Um, about eight or nine years ago, when I started in product management, we really didn't have anything in terms of resources such as a product school, which you all are lucky to have that provides resources uh, and learning from other product professionals and experts um, in, in terms of how to become a better PM. Um, and because of that, a lot of my own learning happened through making mistakes, either small or big. But the benefit of, uh, I guess, attending this talk is that you get to learn from my mistakes and my failures, which will now be public for everyone to analyze and, uh, and investigate. So let's, let's get right into it then. Uh, so here are four of my failures, the stories that I, that I have gone through and the ones that stick out when I look back at my own experience and, uh, and, and see where did I learn the most. These are sort of stories that I remember, uh, not as learnings, but situations where I you know, have these distinct emotions of being scared, of being nervous, and so when I recollect some of these stories, the emotions come flooding back in. So here are my five, my four stories. The first one is, uh-oh, everyone is staring at me now. Story number two is I am terrible at this thing called a sales. Story number three is there is really no easy way out for me. And the fourth one, which is probably the more recent one, is why the hell did I say yes? And um, I'll dive into each of these stories, talk a little bit about the context, what happened there and uh, what my takeaways were. Um, but if you notice the slide a little bit more carefully, uh, some of the words are in white here. They're sort of I'm trying to call some attention to it. The reason for that is whenever I've made mistakes in my career, I've always thought that I was the only one making them. It almost felt as if like the world's attention, like everyone's attention, my boss's attention, my teammates' attention was right on me as a spotlight when I was making um, these mistakes or, uh, or experiencing these failures. But in reality, the sort of opposite is true. Um, you know, we all make mistakes. We all have points in our life or in our career where even if we know what the right thing to do is, sometimes either by accident or by some misfortune, we don't end up doing that. And then the second thing is, a lot of the focus here is on me, I, uh, or myself. Uh, but really like, you know, whenever you make some of these mistakes, just because having failures is natural, uh, I'm pretty sure that, you know, most of the time people's attention were more focused on themselves than um, it was on me in the way that I had imagined. Even for this presentation, um, I may be a little bit nervous, uh, for instance, or I could be nervous 
thinking that if I make a mistake, oh, what will people think of me? But more often than not, people will just, you know, be okay with it. And uh, they will, um, you know, they'll, 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 they'll forgive you and they'll just uh, look over it. Um, so without much ado, let's start with the first one. So, uh-oh, everyone is staring at me now. This was a lesson for me in communication. This um, one um, story was back from 2013 and was from my um, time as an associate product manager. So what had happened was I had graduated from grad school at MIT and I had started this job called as a product manager. And to be honest, I really didn't know uh, what was uh, being a product manager like and what it, it really involved. And being in grad school and being a product manager are alike in some ways. You know, uh, for instance, problem solving is one that comes to mind. In grad school, you take like a complex problem, you break it down into pieces and you sort of figure it out. Whereas in, uh, in, in, in product management, it's, it's pretty similar, right? You take like a complex user need, you try to break it down and you figure things out. Um, but there are a few areas in which being in grad school is totally different than being a, a product manager. And one good example is communication, um, especially to large audiences. You don't do much of that in school, but in, 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 in product roles, a lot of showcasing what you've built sharing your ideas happens with large audiences. And the same thing happened to me at, uh, uh, in, in my first role. I started off with a, with a project and, uh, uh, and I was asked to work on it for the first six months. Um, and the first six months were really good. I got some really good results uh, to show some good metrics to share. And then my boss asked me to present in front of the entire company. Uh, this was a company of about 300 people, a company all hands meeting, I was asked to present. And guess what happened there? I flopped my first ever product presentation, that too in front of 300 people. Um, and the reason for this was, I was super nervous. I had all the information that I wanted to do. And as I said, you know, I was totally not familiar with standing in front of a, a huge audience and presenting it. And, uh, you know, as I distinctly remember, as I was standing there on the podium, my hands were shaking, my heart was beating too fast. I was super nervous and I somehow got through the presentation. I went through my slides and then people started asking me some questions about the work that I had done. Um, and I just couldn't even answer the question. I just had to leave the stage and my boss actually had to step in and uh, take over for me. And this really you know, shook me uh, after my presentation. I mean, I was so scared. I thought they may even fire me. Like how bad was this presentation? But fortunately for me, um, you know, people, you know, looked at more of my work and less of my communication skills or my presentation skills. And give me, give me a little bit of insight into, you know, it's not just enough if you do the work, you need to be able to communicate it. You, you need to be able to share it. You need to be able to inspire others to act upon it. Um, and I wasn't really good at that. I was actually quite bad at it. So then what I did was I started exploring ways in which I could get better, um, given that I was not innately good at doing something like this. So uh, a few friends, as well as my boss at that time, um, recommended Toastmasters to me. So for those who don't know, Toastmasters is this um, sort of nonprofit organization that has a variety of clubs in different geographic areas. And you really go there and build on your presentation skills and confidence in being able to communicate. Now, not being a native English speaker, it was um, just hard for me to get started. And I still remember my first meeting all the way back in 2014, uh, I gave my first icebreaker speech, which is an introduction to, to the group. And it was like a two or three minute speech. And I had 32 ums and uh, filler words, as well as three complete resets, meaning that I had to start over again. But with each speech, I kept at it. With each speech, slowly I got better at communication. I got better at talking to a larger audience. I got better at public speaking. And my initial career feedback, which always used to be around written and oral communication, slowly started turning around and eventually started getting recognized as a strength. 
So one speech at a time, I got better. I got more comfortable. And then product school, for instance, offered me the opportunity to talk in front of uh, a huge audience um, prior to COVID, of course, and I jumped at it. And so over time, even though I may appear today being confident in front of an audience and, and talking in front of them, really behind the scenes, a lot of my communication skills were, uh, were nurtured and it was not an innate nature or an innate skill that I had in myself. Um, recently, Carlos, uh, the CEO of Product School, whom some of you may know, sent this tweet out, which really reminded me of this lesson um, that I had from all those years ago. Product leaders are made, not born. For me, and for PMs in general, communication is a critical skill. But for me, it was a totally learned skill. I only started recognizing that I was bad at it when I became a PM, but I was fortunate enough to be guided by people who recognized that I could get better at it. And I put sustained effort at it, and then I, I, I became better. So that was my first lesson. Um, communication is a critical skill, and then you can get better at it with sustained effort. My second story um, is a lesson in recruiting, actually. And um, the, the lesson was, I'm really terrible at this thing called a sales. So wait a second, I'm saying I'm bad at sales, and the lesson is in recruiting. How does that make sense? Well, what I'm arguing, or what I'm trying to say is recruiting is basically the same thing as sales, except that instead of selling a product, you're sort of selling your own value to the team. You're selling your skills to the team that you're trying to get onto, and you're selling what you can bring to the team. And I will again, take you back to my first role. I'd finished about three years as a product manager in my first role um, in the DC area. And like most of you, uh, you know, I was excited to move on um, uh, to a new role, find new opportunities, and for me, the Bay Area came calling. I really wanted to move to the Bay Area. Lots of exciting, exciting things um, had happened, um, were happening there. And take a note, I actually got my first product role completely by accident. So I actually didn't know how to interview for a product role, what to expect for it, what sort of skills that I, uh, you know, I needed to demonstrate how to sell, uh, you know, what value I could bring to the team. I really had no idea. So I started applying once, you know, I knew my time at my previous company was over, um, you know, reaching out either on company websites, reaching out to people, I started interviewing. Now, remember, I had been an associate product manager and had, you know, even gotten a promotion to be sort of a, you know, senior product manager or what, what have you. So I started applying and guess what happened? I was rejected by almost 20 companies in a row. And it was pretty disheartening um, thinking back about it. Like I would apply, do a phone screen, and then an email would come saying, I'm sorry. Or I would go to on-sites, like I would travel from you know, DC to SF, attend um, on-sites, and then I would get rejected. So I, I, I sort of was confused on what was happening. Like I was a pretty decent product manager, I thought. But what was really happening here was I was a really bad interviewer in the sense that product roles are a little bit tricky where the skills that you build and you develop over your role, building and shipping features are a little bit orthogonal to the interviewing skills. And the contrary is, is also true. You may be like great at product interviews, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee your ability to be successful at a product role. And so what was really happening here was I wasn't doing a good job of positioning my skills, my abilities, and just because I didn't know what product interviews were, I really didn't prepare all that well at all. So then um, eventually I was, uh, you know, I, I, I sent out a cold email. This was one of the last, you know, about to give up hope sort of a situation. Um, I emailed Dropbox, but this time I was determined to do better. So what I did for myself is I was really frustrated. And so I tried my best um, to map out what the interview process was like. I put together, I'm just like a logical person at, um, you know, in, by nature. Um, so I put together this like super detailed uh, action item list and a task list for myself. And coming from a non-technical background, I was weak, for instance, in technical interviewing. I was weak at telling stories. The part of my pitch on why I could bring, you know, uh, how I could help teams out was really bad. Even 
you know, tell a story about yourself or tell, tell, tell me about yourself was also not coming uh, out all that well. So I did mock interviews. I even, when I couldn't find people, I asked myself questions and I recorded myself saying answers to those questions and listened to them. And it was really uncomfortable listening to my own voice, uh, but eventually I got better. And um, eventually for Dropbox, I just, you know, spent a ton of time preparing, ton of time, like figuring out, like, how do I sell my skills? How do I, you know, position things in a way that is convincing to the interviewers, not just to one person, but to the entire, you know, in, in the entire gamut of interviews, whether that's design, technical, um, behavioral, overall interviews and so on. And so eventually, obviously, as you know, based on my background, I ended up landing a role at Dropbox. Um, it uh, really supercharged my career, uh, helped me access a lot of opportunities. And post Dropbox, like finding roles was substantially easier. One, because I had gone through this process and learned that recruiting is all about pitching yourself, depending on what fulfills the need of a company or a team. So my takeaway from this whole exercise um, and from this whole experience um, is basically that recruiting is sales. So in a sense that you always have to be closing. So you have to take this mindset of a salesperson. Um, you have to view your opportunities as, uh, you know, as, as almost like a sales funnel, right? You're not going to convert every one of them, but it's almost like, you know, if I'm a salesperson I'm, uh, and I'm looking to sell to companies, I have this huge top of the funnel. And then over time, I'm going to like go through the process, figure out like how to best position my product to to those companies. And eventually I may get like a you know few successes out of those pools. Recruiting for me is now mentally at least a sales exercise. And um, you know, I think of each company, each role, although as a product manager, is a little bit nuanced. Like some team may be looking um, someone who's a little bit better at growth. Someone may be looking at someone who's a little bit better at uh, uh, you know creating a zero to one product. And for each of those companies, I craft my pitch a little bit differently. I try to offer a resume that's a little bit different, that calls out the points that may be most relevant to them. And it you know, um, also is uh, an exercise in sort of being persistent. You may have failures uh, and even like the best of us, no matter where you work and how well you know what you're doing, you will have failures in recruiting, maybe because of your own fault or maybe it just wasn't a great fit. Um, from from the you know the, the the company standpoint, but you just need to know when to cut your losses and move to some other project or a prospect. So in some ways, what I would encourage everyone here to think is recruiting is different from being a great PM. Spend a lot of time thinking about how would you pitch yourself to uh, you know a, a prospective company, and um, and in the underlying takeaway is to think as a salesperson or think like one. Um, cool. Um, the next story, which is my third story in the list, um, is uh, one that I uh, experienced at Dropbox. And uh, this was a lesson in decision-making. And the way I remember it is uh, no easy way out uh, for me. And uh, the context that I would like to give here is being a product manager sometimes is a little bit of like a lonely job. You are the one who's sort of responsible to guide the team and lead decision-making um, in the right ways to ensure the best outcomes. But at the same time, you have to corral and convince these groups of people, whether that's engineering, designers, sales, marketing people, each of whom or groups of whom have very, very different perspectives on what success means. Um, what they want out of the project. And you have this responsibility of leading them to, um, to the promised land by getting everyone to align in the, same, um, in the same direction. And so this story for me is when I was on the ecosystem team at Dropbox, I was um, you know, building a platform feature uh, uh, for, for Dropbox. And I remember being in this like large conference room uh, and there were like product uh, other product managers other from other teams, of course, uh, from uh, engineers on my team, and uh, you know business folks uh, from the business development team, sales and marketing as well. So there's this big meeting, and we were trying to decide, um, you know, few different options on how we had to proceed for a project. We had the option of 
you know, building something quick and dirty and launching it like relatively soon and hitting some sort of business related targets uh, or on the other side, build something that was elegant and stable and extensible, um, but would take much longer time. So I was in the middle of this conference room and uh, you know, everyone was like, there's this heated debate going on, people like arguing for one option versus the other. And I felt like, you know, a little bit of like, a, you know, these, these arguing factions made me feel like I was the ruler of an anarchist nation. So imagine yourself being in this conference room and like there's all these people like going on about what they care about. And I had this realization at that like debate that no matter how hard I try here, I cannot make everyone happy. I just cannot have everyone be happy, be agreed to the one direction that I would pick for the uh, for the for for this project. And so while I was seeking consensus uh, and presenting options, I had to recognize that where I was failing here was that I was trying to get everyone to agree and be happy with that decision. Whereas in reality, that's not the case. In reality, you have to make the decisions and you have to own up to it. And sometimes like someone's gonna be angry at it, someone's gonna be mad at it. And uh, that's okay because you have to convince them, you know, you have to, or you have to, you know, get a philosophy on my team, which is disagree and commit, which is they may disagree with you, or you have to get them to commit to the direction of the feature. Um, and, and that sort of like brings me to my next point, which is there's this perennial struggle in product decision-making. I call this a perennial struggle because, you know, more often than not, when you're building features or, or products, there's always like, I've seen this more often in my career than not, there's always this like two ends of a spectrum, which is there's the hacky and the fast way to build something, which will disappoint engineering and which will, you know, get business folks and marketing folks excited because you can launch something sooner. They'll of course ignore the technical debt that's uh, that you will be accumulating, um, or the more elegant and slow way of doing um, of building products, which engineers love, like scalable systems, new technologies, um, you know, moving away from existing legacy systems, which will make them really happy. But then business will be sad. Um, and so, like you know, like you occupy the either ends of the spectrum, and like someone or the other is unhappy. You try to occupy something in the middle, and then like everyone's like lukewarm. So of course, like my takeaway was we need to seek consensus, but consensus isn't democracy. It's not like everyone's getting a vote and you pick like the one that most people vote on. Consensus is also not about making everyone happy, right? Uh, it's okay, it's people can be, you know, some, some part of your audience or your stakeholders will be unhappy. Um, consensus is not getting your boss's approval uh, and consensus is certainly not having everyone lukewarm about something. Uh, the big realization here is as the PM, you are the decision maker, that's your role. Nobody's gonna hand your decision down. And in some cases, people will be angry, mad or sad or some combination of, of the above, and it's okay. And to be truly successful and build features that move the needle, some cases you have to be contrarian. You have to say, um, you know, go ahead with maybe your gut instinct, some data, and maybe not everyone agrees with you. Um, you obviously as a PM have insights and observations that others don't have. And for instance, in the Dropbox example, I ended up siding with the engineers. We took more time, we shipped something that would serve us better in the long run. Uh, so the bottom line, my takeaway here was I, I tried far too long and far too hard to get everyone aligned on the same page uh, and be happy with what I was picking. But then in the end, because of time or constraints, I just gave up. And then it worked out okay. It, you know, we shipped something, you know, people were a little bit disappointed that it shipped a little late, but it had the impact that it needed to have on the market. Uh, engineering of course was of course happy because I said it with them in that case, um, but we moved on. So that's gonna be my takeaway for, you know, there's really no way out for me to make everyone happy, but you know, uh, it doesn't have to be that way. My, my fourth uh, lesson here is, uh, uh, is a lesson in conviction. And the, the lesson I tell to myself is why did I say yes? Why the hell did I say yes? Um, as product managers, our role uh, in, our, in, in, in any organization is to build features and products that are valuable to users. And the way we do this is obviously by gathering signals, data or anecdotes or feedback, 
we try to build a justification for what sort of a product or feature is valuable, and then we deliver on it. We build the technology necessary, and then once we launch it, you know, the, the proof of the pudding is is you hope that it brings in the intended impact, number of users, revenue, and uh, and and what all the good things to come after that, and. Obviously, as a PM, you need to make decisions. You need to get people aligned, as I've talked um, in my previous story. But what precedes decision making is building conviction. That is, you need to justify to yourself. You need to build that conviction to know that this is actually valuable. And this story um, that I'm going to share uh, is in my current role um, at, at Coalition, where I was asked to build a um, uh, uh, an integration through a partnership. And uh, this was a pretty perceived to be a pretty important project. Uh, and uh, I spent three months of my life on building this project at my current role. Um, and what happened after three months of spending my life building something, I got zero paying customers um, achieved. And in the startup environment, that's pretty bad because you're running against the clock, you have limited funding, you spend three months building something to drive revenue, and then you get, um, you know, you you get nobody to pay you for it. That's a pretty bad scenario. So now you may ask me, like, Kathan, why did you work on this project? Like, what prompted you to work on this? Um, and the the, the and, and did you have the conviction that this would really work um, when um, you built this feature? The the short answer to this question is. Um, you know, looking back, when I kicked off this project with my team, like fundamentally at the core, I just didn't have the conviction that this would really be successful. I just didn't believe in myself in that, like, hey, this project is actually, you know, going to move the needle for us. But then why did I work on it? Uh, well, the short answer is I worked on it because the CEO and the leadership asked me to work on it. Um, and, uh, you know, it was meant to be a short project for three weeks it just extended and became three months. And, you know, looking back, a lot of us are in the situation where, you know, some leader or some, you know, your boss or your boss's boss wants you to build something. And uh, they probably give you some signals saying like, hey, we think that this is kind of interesting. We think this is kind of important. Let's go build it. And it's not easy to fight that, uh, um, fight that request and say no. And, you know, in many cases, like, the directive is not one that is like, hey, you go build this exact feature. The, the, the directive stems from an idea of like what might be helpful um, for, for the team. And so I built this feature, it was unsuccessful. And for me, the lesson or the takeaway um, on what I would have done differently the next time around is I would have, I would have tried to build a stronger justification, a stronger case for why something would be successful or whether it would make sense for us to do something, regardless of who asked for it. So what I ended up doing um, in my current organization is we tried to institute, institute a little bit of a product process, right? That everyone has to follow, regardless of where an idea comes from, whether it's from an engineer, a salesperson, um, a COO, a head of talent or CEO, we need to follow this structured process on answering why something is important um, then we'll go like how we'll build it, what we need to do it. And, and, and really the why step is the conviction building step. It is built with the, uh, it, it investigates the real justification for a project. And I built this process and got everyone to align on it, the entire product team aligned on it and the leadership aligned on it. And so really, you know, having a product process uh, that um, everyone's aligned to creates a simpler environment because now if someone asks you like, hey, what do you think of this idea? You put through, through this test of like, why do we need to build this? Why do, we, why do we need to do this? Does this make sense? Like creating the justification for why something is a must have really helps the entire organization invest its time and effort in the right direction. Uh, and so what happened as an outcome was, although I failed at that project, spent a bunch of months, didn't really like move the needle, subsequent projects have had a lot better luck. Um, we have, uh, you know, put it through this process, gotten signals, justification, and at least I believe that we've invested our time a lot more fruitfully since then. Um, and so this was a lesson for me in building conviction. Like, how do I build conviction for myself before building a feature? 
Um, and how do I communicate that conviction? And how do I let others build the conviction while keeping all the facts on the table? And in some cases, like building something may not be a good idea, and that's okay. Um, but how do you how do you get that conviction, which is most critical, was a learning lesson for me. Now I know the title of this talk said five lessons, but uh, you know I'm, I, I did run out of time, so uh, I, I kept the meeting sh the, the the presentation short and shared four of my lessons. Um, in communication, recruiting, decision-making, and conviction, which hopefully gives all of you a little bit of insight into some of the lessons that I learned and how it made me probably a little bit better as a product manager. So my first lesson was in communication. Communication is obviously critical, though it's more of like a nurturing process to become a better, good communicator and not really like an innate nature for the most of us. Some of you probably will be great at um, communication, the rest of us, we just can nurture it and make become better at it. For recruiting, think, think like a salesman, prepare like a salesman. Um, think about how do you pitch yourself? Prepare on diligence, prepare on identifying what points resonate and really be structured in your approach and success will be ensured. Decision-making, um, as I said earlier, you can't win everyone over. You just have to you know, deal with it and be okay with that trade-off. And then finally, uh, conviction. Build conviction for yourself. Go through that process, regardless of who asks you to you know, work on something before you can convince others and have rely on structured processes to, to, to get there. Um, and so that was it. Um, you know, I, I wanted to have like a short presentation here. Um, did want to thank everyone for listening to my talk uh, and for being a part of this. Um, you know, hopefully product schools, uh, this talk, as well as other resources they offer, help you with your own objectives, whether that's finding a product role, growing in your own career. Um, and I know the online format isn't great for asking questions, but if you do have any questions on what I covered here, just feel free to reach out to me on uh, on the internet. You can obviously find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is at Ketan Nayak, uh, or you can also search for me and look for me on LinkedIn. Uh, but I did want to say a thank you to everyone and uh, you know for taking the time to be a part of this. So thank you once again.